Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Stephen Burgess. I'm the Deputy Service Manager, part of the Sibling Family Team, and currently working on for probate. Um, and today I'm supported by James Helm, who's an Operational Support Manager within my team. Uh, so we're going to talk to you about the digital journey in probate so far and what some of the next steps are. So the presentation today will talk you. I'll talk you through a update performance um, so far for this year and previous years. Uh, some of the improvements that we've made so far um, up to November 2021 and then through to November 2022 for probate practitioners and just really highlighting some of those upcoming improvements that we have for probate practitioners. Um, I'm sure everyone's aware that probate being part of the Ref HMCTS wider reform project. Um, as part of the reform project, probate was uh, tasked with looking at a uh, implementing a digital service which streamlined applications and made it easier for users to make an application for probate. Probate has since moved out of the reform project and we're now in business as usual and that's where my team uh, supports the operational processes um, looking at any digital improvements but also support uh, with day-to-day -day support to the business. Um, the digital system which went live in 2019 for citizens and 2020 for probate practitioners has allowed the probate service to continue um, throughout all the challenges faced through the COVID-19 pandemic, um, allowed us to mobilise staff working from home a lot easier and we moved paper out of the process which also made us much simpler for us to process applications. So since October 2019, uh, the digital system now has issued over 205,000 grants. Um, this slide just shows our pattern for our receipts against grants issued. So grants issued is in the brown colour and receipts in the blue. Uh, we can see that receipts generally exceed uh, our grants issued, which is uh, normal, um, that, that sort of increase in receipts is our head of work which sits in our lot in our system and is currently being worked on so that's what we would expect to see um, on a normal year this slide looks at our receipts and grants book broken down into quarters and focused on quarter one and quarter two which is our latest published stats and uh, we've in those two quarters so for the, the First half of the year of 2021, we've issued approximately 140,000 grants uh, and receipts are sitting around about 153,000 grants. Uh, so as you can see, it does follow the same pattern with receipts being um, exceeding the issues, like I say, which is perfectly normal. Uh, we will be publishing some data for Q3 very shortly. Um, what we're seeing in Q3 data um, roughly at the moment is that receipts have actually ex um, issued grants has actually exceeded our grants um, as we're working on reducing that head of work so what we may be referred to as a backlog is starting to come down and reduce. The rest of the projection for 2021 looks like we'll exceed what we issued in 2020 and also in, pre in previous years um, like I say we will publish those figures um, as, as we get towards uh, shortly. So some of the key facts from that. So our digital uptake for 2021, uh, we've seen this um, start off low for personal applicants. So it was around about 52%, um, lower than 52% at the beginning of the year, but we've seen this steadily increase. So the end of Q2 was at 52% and we have seen this steadily increase uh, throughout the remainder of 2021. Um, we continue to look at improvements for this for personal applicants. Um, we've recently done an update on gov.uk, which hopefully simplifies the process and tested very well with um, some customers that we worked with. Uh, probate practitioners, uh, since the mandation in November 2020, we've seen, seen this steadily increase. Um, our target with mandation was around about 80% of cases were, should, would be acceptable uh, through the MyHMCTS portal. Um, and I'd say at the end of quarter two, we were at 76%, which is roughly where we want to be, but we're constantly looking at improving that. 
Uh, some of our timeliness in quarter two for 2021. Uh, so the average um, from when documents have been received to the grants being issued was 5.4 weeks. For digital applications, this is slightly quick, slightly quicker than the paper application. So it's 3.6 weeks and paper applications are sitting around 9.4 weeks. Some of the challenges uh, that we faced over the past year with, with the pandemic, um, it did see us move a lot to remote working. So that was something we were able to mobilize very quickly. Um, so when it happened in March 2020, you know, 80% of our workforce was from home. Um, but with the digital system, we were able to make sure that people could continue working from home as we weren't required to move paper files from offices to home and backwards. So, so that was really important. Overall grant levels, even though with all the challenges we faced, have remained consistent with other, other years, as you could see from some of the stats that we produced in the earlier slides. And like I say, um, we'll be able to post any links to the stats if, if no one's aware where they're published on gov.uk. Uh, digital uptake is steadily increasing throughout the year. Like I say, it was um, low below 50 percent at the beginning of the year um, but we've done a bit of a campaign with um, citizens to you know advertise it uh, looking at improving the guidance trying to simplify it as much as possible and that's involved us working with hmrc because i think you know we're very closely linked and making sure that their guidance is as clear as ours there's been significant impact on paper cases so we've seen that reduce um Paper cases reduced to around about 20% now, where it was as high as 20% at the start of the pandemic. And again, that you know was really supported us and being able to work remotely. And then finally, um, being a big push and focus on the staff retention and making sure that staff are trained. Um, so that's been something that we focused on this year to make sure that you know, whether that's a call handler answering the phone is equipped to answer the query. Um, emails that received or just the general issue of grants. Thanks Steve. Uh, so I'm going to take over and discuss some of the improvements that have been made since November 2020 uh, up until the present day. Um, so as Steve alluded to with the mandation of the service back in November 2020, uh, in tandem with that one of the first things we did uh, was allow practitioners um, to uh, see their cases at every point um, in the end-to-end -end journey. Um, so this allows them to get real-time updates uh, from submission to grant issue, uh, where previously uh, at the point of submission, practitioners would no longer uh, be able to see their cases. Uh, so we hope that that has helped improve visibility uh, of cases as they make their way through the system. Uh, in December 2020, uh, we made a minor update to the Intessacy online journey. Uh, we were informed by users that there was a bug uh, whereby if practitioners indicated that the applicant was a spouse or civil partner, they were then asked a question uh, asking if that spouse or civil partner had, had siblings, which of course has no bearing on their entitlement to the grant. So we fixed that. In addition, uh, users were erroneous, erroneously asked a question uh, where if they had indicated that the deceased died domiciled in England or Wales, they were then asked a question as to whether the uh, estate consisted only of a movable property, uh, so we fixed that as well. Uh, in addition, we also just improved um, the uh, framing of some of the questions to make it clearer uh, to users. Uh, on to 2021. So in February 2021, uh, very much akin to the intestacy update uh, with the admin will uh, part of the digital journey, uh, we made that same fix where if the uh, estate if the deceased, sorry, uh, decide to uh, die domiciled uh, in England or Wales, they're again asked that question uh, of where, whether the uh, estate consisted only of a movable property. Uh, we fixed that as well, as well as improving, again, just the general flow uh, of that part of the digital journey. Uh, in addition, uh, and on the back of lots of user feedback, um, we released the case progress tab. Uh, so this was in response to users uh, who are having some problems uh, in submitting applications uh, using the My HMCTS portal, uh, as well as just tracking their applications uh, as, it may, as it made its way through the service. 
Um, so the case progress tab aims to improve the quality uh, of information available to practitioners, and uh, we hope that that has since made a difference. Furthermore, in February, uh, and mainly in response um, to the number of stops that were occurring uh, in this area, but also in, in, in response to user feedback, uh, we made some improvements uh, to the service uh, in the uh, in the journey whereby if practitioners were applying with an IHD 400 and IHD 41 form. Uh, this mainly included improving the guidance uh, on the importance of waiting 20 working days uh, between submitting these forms to HMRC uh, and then applying for probate with HMCTS, uh, as well as building in questions into the journey uh, whereby users were asked when they had submitted these forms uh, to ensure that they were only submitting their applications uh, once these 20 working days had elapsed. Uh, this has since helped reduce uh, some of the stops uh, where IHT 41s were not originally present uh, on the case. Uh, this has made a marked improvement uh, from the beginning of the pandemic, uh, where originally emails uh, containing the IHT 41 uh, were sent to HMTTS via HMRC uh, and understandably this was a very manually intensive process for caseworkers. Uh, on to May 2021 uh, and again in response to lots of user feedback uh, we released the ability for practitioners to delete unsubmitted cases from the My HMCTS dashboard. Uh, there are a few cases that a, uh, a case could be unsubmitted uh, for example uh, if that case was unable to be applied for online. Uh, so we hope that this has since helped uh, reduce the amount of bloat on, uh, on your portal uh, to allow better case management. Uh, furthermore, and this is again more of an internal process, uh, but we've been working closely with HMRC um, and have since implemented a SharePoint solution, um, which again uh, is an improvement on the manual checking of emails. Um, this has made it much easier for caseworkers uh, to more efficiently check uh, for the IHT 41 uh, in order to progress a case. Uh, in June 2021, uh, we did a review of all our supporting forms. Um, the improvements we made to these were mainly, mainly minor grammatical tweaks. Uh, however, we, we also improved the guidance um, where forms could be signed with a typed signature uh, as opposed to just a, uh, a wet in signature. Uh, we also added Welsh language options uh, for all of these supported forms, uh, supporting forms as well. On to June 2021, um, again in response to lots of user feedback, um, we were aware that some users uh, were having problems with the cover sheet that was generated uh, upon submission. Uh, we understood uh, that this cover sheet was only present um, at the point of submission uh, and disappeared, and especially when this was required to be sent with supporting documents, uh, we understood the frustrations of users here. Uh, so we have since implemented a permanently accessible cover sheet. Uh, this includes not only the address of where to send these documents, uh, but also uh, your case number is automatically generated, uh, as well as some of the documents that you're required to be uh, to send. Uh, and this cover sheet can be found in the new cover sheet tab uh, that is available uh, and visible on the My HMCTS portal. Uh, next slide, sleep. Um, so on to August 2021, uh, what is uh, undoubtedly uh, our most significant release. Um, this release brought lots of improvements as well as improving uh, the functionality offered by the service. Uh, so to begin with, uh, this release brought the, uh, brought the ability uh, for trust corporations to apply online uh, for a grant of probate. Um, included within this, um, was options to better account for executors. Um, so this included uh, where partners, members, uh, shareholders uh, and directors in a firm are applying. In addition, uh, we also added uh, dispense with notice for uh, where executors weren't applying. Uh, furthermore, and again in response to user feedback, um, we understood the problems users were having in their inability to amend the initial stage of the application, i.e. the probate practitioner's details. Um, this was causing difficulties, for example, uh, where typographical mistakes were made, say on the name or the address, uh, which were then unfixable. Uh, so as part of the release, we have now implemented the ability uh, to amend all parts of the application. Uh, furthermore, we've added the ability to upload uh, a legal statement uh, via MyHMCTS. 
Um, this is obviously only for signed legal statements that have been agreed, um, but this helps reduce the amount of documents uh, that are needed to be sent through to the scanning team. Furthermore, uh, and again in response to user feedback, we understood the frustrations uh, on the old legal statement where only uh, there was there was only the facility for one signature. Um, we have now since uh, amended this so that it dynamically populates according to the amount of applying applicants in addition to the practitioner. Furthermore, we introduced a significant improvement, uh, which is the al allowing practitioners, uh, assuming they are so authorised, uh, to sign the legal statement on behalf of their client. And this is supported by the new statement of truth, uh, which was also implemented as a result of the release on August 19th. Uh, finally, uh, we also added the ability um, for users to apply online where they have a notarial or court sealed copy of the will, where previously uh, users could only apply where they had the original will. Um, the final improvement of note that has since been made uh, up until this point, and again, Steve has already alluded to this, uh, but in the end of October, uh, we made significant improvements to the gov.uk uh, probate guidance. Uh, obviously, this is mainly aimed at personal applicants, um, but obviously practitioners do and can and do use this as well. Uh, so this was in tandem uh, working with the government digital service, uh, as well as carrying out multiple rounds uh, of user feedback and iterating from this point onwards. Uh, next slide, please, Steve. Uh, so I thought I'd just uh, point out a couple of the new screens that were implemented as part of the uh, Trust Corporation release, as we called it, on the 19th of August. Uh, so I'm sure you're very familiar with this uh, first page. Um, we thought it worth pointing out um, the importance of these questions uh, in, in relation to the, the journey. Um, so this initial question, is the probate practitioner named in the will as an executor, should only be answered if the practitioner is specifically named and appointed by name. Um, if users are, for example, appointed in the will uh, via proxy of being a director partner, for example, in a firm, uh, you should actually answer no to this question. Uh, if you are uh, so named, so you're part of a firm, you should then answer yes uh, to the question, is the probate practitioner acting as an executor? Uh, the significance of this is that this is how we've tied um, the generating uh, of the appropriate title and clearing in the legal statement. So just to reiterate, Obviously, if you're not applying as an executor, uh, you would answer no and no to both questions. Uh, if you are applying as an executor specifically named by name in the will, you'd answer yes and yes or yes and no, depending on if you are renouncing or holding power reserved. And obviously, if you're applying as part of a firm, uh, you should choose the option no, yes. Um, do you mind going to the next slide, please, Steve? Uh, and again, uh, as previously mentioned, this is uh, the page where this has real significance. Um, so if, for example, you had answered no and yes to the questions discussed prior, um, you would then in be included as being sort of part of uh, whatever uh, option bar none of these. Um, next question, please. Uh, slide, please, Steve. Um, so we also thought we'd give uh, practitioners uh, a quick overview of some of the upcoming improvements, uh, both the more immediate improvements, but also some of the improvements that are more far off. Um, so we are currently looking at enhancing uh, the permanently accessible cover sheet. So this is the cover sheet I uh, referenced previously. Um, this will, will include improvements to include uh, triggers for supporting forms, such as the renunciation forms, PA 15, 16, 17, uh, the medical certificate form, PA 14, uh, as well as some others, um, such as if you're applying with a foreign will, um, a reminder to send an authenticated translation. Uh, and if, for example, uh, you were applying as a trust corporation uh, and you had indicated that you were sending the resolution in with your application, uh, this would include uh, the trigger to send this resolution uh, with your application. This is all with the, the aim of making this uh, cover sheet um, a more accurate source of truth uh, in terms of uh, capturing all of the documents that are required to be sent to the probate registry. Uh, and again, this will help us reduce the amount of stops 
as uh, the um, need or rather missing documents is one of our top five stop reasons. Um, in terms of other improvements, um, users will I'm sure be aware of the two various uh, caveat forms in circulation. So there is a P88A for personal applicants and then a P88A uh, for probate practitioners. Uh, the practitioner version includes both the entry and extension of a caveat. Um, we have since been looking at these forms and are taking the decision to combine them um, so that they will be used by both personal applicants and probate practitioners uh, alike, as well as splitting their functionality. So there will be a P88A for the entry of a caveat and then a P88B uh, for the extension of a caveat. Um, in tandem uh, with these new forms uh, will be updated gov.uk guidance. Um, when we get a little bit closer, uh, to being able to being in the position to publish these forms, um, we will be sending out uh, some communications to ensure that users are aware of the upcoming change. Um, we are very keenly aware of the um, interest users have in uh, sharing uh, their applications with other people within their organisation, uh, the so-called share a case functionality, um, and we are presently working uh, on including um, this ability uh, within the service. And we hope to have this uh, completed uh, by the end of Q1 2022. But obviously this is a moving picture. Um, I'm sure practitioners will also be aware, um, especially in response to the recent announcement uh, from HMRC, uh, there is a legislative change uh, coming into force on the 1st of January 2022. Um, so much of our effort at the moment is devoted to making the necessary um, amendments, the paper forms, uh, the relevant online services and the relevant gov.uk guidance to ensure that we are already uh, in time for this change on the 1st of January. Uh, next slide, please, Steve. Um, in terms of some, some sort of more far away improvements, um, we have been for quite a while now uh, been working on the uh, updating of the PA1P and PA1A uh, application forms. Um, so the changes these forms will bring will, as with the caveat forms, there are currently two different versions in circulation, one for personal applicants and one for probate practitioners. Uh, this will combine the forms. So there's just one form, uh, one, PA, a, a, one PA1P and 1PA1A in circulation for use by both personal applicants and probate practitioners. Uh, in addition, um, where presently probate practitioners are sending these forms uh, to either Newcastle or Cardiff Registry, uh, these forms will now all be sent um, via bulk scan at the point they, that will then be converted into digital cases. And this will help uh, improve timeliness on our end. Furthermore, um, and again, because it's one of our largest stop reasons, um, we're going to be looking at including um, some questions uh, into the digital service uh, that will help users explain uh, and capture any plight and condition of the will. Um, so we're currently working on including these questions within the personal applicant digital journey, uh, but this will be uh, tweaking and replicating uh, the work that we've done there in the probate practitioner journey. Uh, and again, the uh, aim of this work is to uh, help reduce the amount of stops uh, that are placed on cases where there are any questions uh, surrounding the condition of the will. Um, finally, um, we are looking at, um, in the early investigations, of looking how we uh, can enhance uh, the functionality uh, of both the probate practitioner and the personal applicant digital journey. Uh, next slide, please. And that takes us back to Steve. Thanks, James. Um, so just a bit of information now, if, if there's uh, if any helps ever needed, and um, you can speak to a caseworker um, available at the Courts and Tribunal Civil Service Centre um, on the number on screen. Um, if you do have a query about your application, um, you can contact the Courts and Tribunal Service, uh, Service Centre. Um, on contact probate at justice.gov.uk um, and that someone will respond to you within 10 working days on that. If you do have an application, uh, you're a Welsh speaker, you can speak to somebody in Welsh on the number on screen. 
if you have an issues anything related to your myhmc ets account if you can't access cases uh having problems logging in if something's disappeared um you can speak to the team that are responsible for the my my hmc ets accounts at my hmc ets support at justice.gov.uk um, if you do have any queries which are for me or james um, not related to the in particular to the presentation but anything uh, regarding any feedback regards the service uh, the digital service um, or any queries, um, you know, you can contact us at our usual, uh, but that is probatefeedback at justice.gov.uk. And that's really the end of the presentation. And just to open it up to um, all yourselves, if there are any questions that you have for us today. OK. We now move on to the Q&A session of the event. Uh, my name is Nari Scott. I work in HMCTS in the Access and Inclusion team. I'll be facilitating this Q&A session. Firstly, can I thank Stephen and James for their very informative presentation on the digital journey so far in the probate service. Um, so we're now going to have time for questions. So please do continue to post them in the Q&A function. Um, I would like to start, first of all, with the first question that has been sent in, which is, are there any plans to expand the functionality of the service for the probate practitioners? And if so, what further functionality are you looking at adding? Um, can I pose that question to James, please? Sure thing. Um, so as previously mentioned, we are looking at expanding the service. Uh, at the moment, uh, we're currently looking at, uh, or rather investigating um, the feasibility of expanding the intestacy journey. Um, so this would include uh, perhaps in uh, allowing multiple children to apply, uh, potentially grandchildren uh, and any issue from there and uh, potentially parents as well. Um, but again, we are at the very early stages of investigating this. Uh, in addition, uh, we're also beginning to investigate uh, the potential to facilitate uh, attorney applications. Uh, so this could be where you're applying with a PA11, PA12 form, uh, an enduring or lasting power of attorney, a general power of attorney, uh, or where there's a deputy appointed by the Court of Protection. Um, in addition, uh, we're also looking at potentially further enhancing the grant of probate journey, um, <coughs> perhaps adding further options, title and clearing options, for example, uh, to allow uh, all partners, shareholders, directors, members and a firm to hold power reserve or the ability uh, for trust corporations to announce. Um, but uh, renounce, sorry, uh, but just worth reiterating, these are at the very early stages. Thank you. Thank you, James, for that. Stephen, I have a, a question that's been posed, if you could uh, go for it. The question is, what work, if any, is planned on improving the quality of updates and requests for information on cases? Thanks. Um, yep, so as we mentioned, and I'm sure everyone uh, listening is aware that, you know, we've introduced the case progress tab um, but we are aware that more can be done to improve the quality of some of the notifications that go out and, and requests for information, both for practitioners and also for personal applicants alike. Um, we are currently in the midst of a project which is um, revol involved as extensively mapping um, any gaps that go with the automatic notifications. So we're aware that when an application is received and documents come in that a notification is sent to all users. Uh, we're trying to see if we can put that earlier on. Um, and that's again, both for both types of applicants. Um, we're reviewing and drafting new content for existing and new notifications. So where we've identified there's a gap, um, looking at our analysis of contact around phone calls or emails, um, requesting updates, we're trying to see if we can build something automatically into that system. We're also aware that some people have not been receiving notifications. Um, so we are looking to see what we can do to improve that. One of the things we've noticed is that if a email isn't provided or if an email isn't entered, obviously the notifications uh, can't work. So we're trying to do if, if we can do something to make that, you know, must be mandatory, uh, which is on the digital applications, but unfortunately not on the paper applications, but we, we're trying to change that. Uh, and then also in the process of standardizing and reviewing the content of all those emails and making sure that they're clear and concise that when they go out, that they answer the 
the stop reason, uh, you know, the reason we've paused the application um, at the first attempt, because uh, we know it's any communication on a stop, you know, it's important that we get that right first time. So we get that information back straight away that enables us to process the application and get the grant issued in a timely manner. Thank you for that. OK, the next question, James, if you would be able to pick up is what work, if any, is planned on reducing the amount of stops on cases? Thanks, sorry. Um, so yes, as uh, aforementioned, uh, we are looking at building in questions um, to <coughs> allow users to explain uh, plight and condition of the will. Uh, so I can just expand uh, slightly further uh, on what that may entail. Um, so we would be asking users um, whether there was any damage to the will and or code of sales, uh, and if so, what type of damage, um, whether the reasons for the damage were known, whether it was known who may have damaged the will and or code of sales, uh, whether the date of the damage was known, <coughs> and also whether there were any other written wishes. Um, so uh, questions around validity, validity of the will, as I mentioned previously, is sort of one of our top five stop reasons. Um, furthermore, we are in the very early stages of exploring the potential um, to allow the automatic checking of the IHT 41 um, between HMRC and HMCTS. Obviously, uh, it's, for, it's com complicated further because of the need to uh, work between government departments uh, rather than just one government department, <coughs> uh, but we are exploring, uh, beginning to explore that. Um, so I'd say those are the two uh, most uh, at the fore. Thank you for that, James. Um, the next question, Stephen, if, if you could pick up, is from um, a question from the public that would basically say um, they would be interested to know the proportion of practitioners to personal applicants, if you could actually inform us of that. Yeah, um, so that that is actually closing. Um, I've been around and probate for a very long time. Um, and when I first started in probate, it was probably 70% practitioners to 30% personal applicants. But as the years have progressed and probably as people become more familiar with forms and uh, more confident in completing forms because they appear to be part of everything that you do in life, that, that has started to close. And we're probably sort of 60, 40 percent and probably just a little bit under that now. Um, haven't got the exact figure to hand, but I remember looking the last time we were around about that 60, 40. So, uh, you know, it is a gap that's for forever closing. Thank you for that. And moving on, uh, James, a question for yourself. Um, if the practitioner would prefer not to sign the legal statement, is this possible? Um, we only seem to be able to process an application if the practitioner signs the legal statement, even if they would prefer not to. Are you able to answer that one? Yeah. Um, so due to limitations in the system, uh, we always need to generate the probate practitioner's name on the legal statement. Uh, we can't we can't hide that. However, uh, the functionality is there uh, purely for ease. So if you prefer uh, that the applicant sign, um, only their signatures are required, except um, if you are an applicant who will be named on the grant. Um, so just to reiterate, you do not need to sign the legal statement. Uh, unless you are an applicant who will be named on the grant, uh, the functionality is purely there um, if the applicants authorise you to sign on their behalf. Um, In-depth guidance is contained uh, both within the service, so on the page uh, called Review Legal Statement and Declaration, uh, it's the first page within the complete application step. Um, the rules are, are laid out uh, there. In addition, um, the step-by-step -step guidance, which is linked to from the very, very first page uh, upon creating a case. Um, I think it's step 6.11 there. Um, that guidance also uh, lays out uh, in detail the rules surrounding who and uh, who can sign the legal statement. I hope that helps. Thank you. Thank you for that, James. OK, a question for Steve. This has actually come from uh, an overseas um, attendee and it's from the Michigan State Court Administrative Office and they're asking what happens with contentious cases? Okay, um, I, I suppose at, at what stage of contentious it, it comes to um, some of the smaller contentious matters can be dealt with by 
registrars. Uh, so we currently have three registrars within the probate service who can deal with with some um, minor contentious matters. Um, and and the, those applications come through and uh, the registrars would book a hearing usually for both parties. Um, but I'm, I'm presuming that is, is probably more of a con more contentious case, which falls outside of our rules that th this is referring to. Um, and again, th that would depend on it, but usually go through to the Chancery Court um, and an application is made there. And, you know, that will go before a district judge who will make a, a decision. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it all depends. Very minor contentious probate cases can be dealt with um, within the probate service by our registrars. Um, but if not, it's usually an application to Chancery. Thank you for that. Uh, another question for Stephen come through. Are you planning to introduce an API to allow integration with case management systems? And if so, how close are you to introducing this, please? Um, yeah, it is something we're aware of. Um, we recognise there's high demand uh, for offering integration through APIs because um, I know this helps with double keying, um, allows updates to be shared in real, real time, etc. Um, there are plans to take this forward initially in the civil jurisdiction and then we hope that that could be extended that design out to other jurisdictions in the future. Um, a time frame on that we currently don't have at the moment, um, so we wouldn't be able to provide any information. I do know that there's a team being set up to look at these APIs and you know as soon as we have any information that we can share that you know what will be integrated in probate that will be something we would happily do. Thank you for that Stephen. Um, another one for Steve again um, just come through is Steve is it possible for all stop reasons to be given when a case is looked at rather than repeated stops for multiple issues causing frustration for clients? Yes, yes. Um, this is something that we've been aware of and it's something that we're trying to uh, address uh, with the operations teams. Um, I think it, it's fell down to training more than more than the system. Um, we're aware that some caseworkers will look, have been looking at a case and when they come to a stop, uh, stopping the case there and then uh, sending something out. But, uh, you know, we're failing to complete the process of checking the rest of the case, uh, which is very frustrating, um, both for ourselves, yourselves and then, you know, um, your clients. Um, so this has been addressed in training. We've made sure that communications have gone out recently uh, over the past couple of months just to make sure that, you know, we are looking at a case from start to finish. There will, there will be some times when we look at a case and depending on what information we get back in, there might be another reason for a stop, but that, that is in the you know very small minority. So yeah, it is something we're aware of. We've we've received this feedback. We we are picking up ourselves in, in cases that are having to be reworked and you know case workers are saying, you know, this has been stopped for this but not this. So it is something we are addressing. Um so I would hope you start to see that improving um for the rest of this year and into 2022. OK, I think that brings to an end all the questions that have been posed. Um, that basically remains for me to thank the both James and Stephen for the presentation and actually answering all those questions as well. If you have any further specific questions you would like to pose to the probate team, they can be emailed on probatefeedback at justice.gov.uk. Um, but thank you very much to our presenters. It's a really interesting session and thank you to all those who have joined and asked the questions as well. Don't forget, uh, we have a Q&A panel closing the event. If you'd like to submit a question in advance, just email change something that matters at justice.gov.uk. And it's for me to say thank you very much for attending the event and look forward to hearing from you next year.